Welcome to another edition of What's Next in Security, and a great pleasure to welcome Troy Hunt, his uh, well-known web security expert. And uh, for those of you who have, um, you know, had your security credential credentials compromised, you might have visited Be Pawned at one stage and found out if your email address is sitting there. Well, that's one site that uh, Troy has found. He's also a Microsoft Regional Director and very, very much in touch with what's happening in the world of security. Troy, it's great to see you and thank you for joining us on What's Next. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm in, in a, a good world to be at the moment, I think. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I tell you, this uh, pandemic has really changed the world that we're living in. I mean, your game is security. Um, wh what have you seen uh, with COVID-19 and this pandemic? And I keep telling organizations that security is the Achilles heel. What are you saying on the cybersecurity front? Well, it's it's sort of an interesting time. I, I think what's probably most relevant as it relates to the COVID situation is we've got a whole bunch of people who've suddenly been forced into a way of working digitally, which they didn't have the luxury of, of planning for. Uh, and that uh, that extends all the way from what sort of services do people use, or the very often it's services which are publicly accessible, through to just logistical things about the exposure of, of what would otherwise have been personal conversations in very different ways. And I'll give you a good example of this. We, we had a period there for a while where the, the kids had to learn from home. And I remember mm. going into my son's room one day and he's on Microsoft Teams and it's all working very, very well. And all the other boys are there. He's in a boys' school. And I, I thought, well, this is, this is fascinating. It's working so well. And then behind one of the boys, his dad's having like a business conversation on the phone talking about details of the deal. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you did not think this bit through, <laughs> did you? But th this is the sort of interesting social aspects that uh, are now putting people at risk as well. Now, that's very, very interesting. I mean, what, what changes have you basically seen in, in the kinds of data breaches uh, since the kind of lockdown began around about March of this year? Um, different kinds of cyber attacks, for example. In, and does it vary according to countries since the lockdown? Look, I, I, all of this is anecdotal, right? Because very hard mm. to get like hard, reliable numbers on this. And particularly things like data breaches, uh, we, we always sort of talk about what we know being the tip of the iceberg. Now, if that's fragments like the 10% of what is out there, then we've all only ever got this kind of like tiny, tiny lens into it. Now, anecdotally, yeah. I really haven't seen much of a change in data breaches. There was a, a period there a couple of months ago where some researchers were saying, oh, look, it looks like they've dropped off. And then we just had like a flood of data come through recently. We just have to look at what's been loaded into Have I Been Pwned to see that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, would, uh, I would suggest if I was to be a little bit uncharitable that there's a lot more kids at home at the moment, so we might be seeing more breaches because a lot of the time it is from kids or very young adults who are frankly just having a go. Um, so, you know, there's that side of things. I think if we look at the things that we can quantify, that we can specifically point to and say what has happened since COVID, yeah, a lot of it comes down to things like Zoom meetings, you know. I mean, geez, it was only a couple of days ago there was a bit in the news about this Dutch journalist who managed to drop into some yeah, defence ministry meeting with a whole bunch of heads <laughs> of state talking about, uh, assumably, like really, really important defence stuff, and the guys just figured out the password because someone who joined the meeting had taken a photo of, of her screen, and there you go, there's the whole URL and everything. So I think what's really interesting now is people are having to sort of figure out the social aspects of security yeah that happen when you are now in your home as opposed to in your place of work. Yeah. No, that's very interesting. I mean, the vulnerabilities. I mean, are the, what are the cyber threats that, uh, that that concern you the most? Is there anything that's keeping you awake at night? Look, I think what keeps me awake at night, and it's it's maybe it's just because I have a, a, a fundamental dislike of this, It's is the exploitation of the COVID situation for other people's gain. Now, we, we see this every time there's any sort of noteworthy event in the world. You know, one of the ones that comes to mind is when the Malaysian plane went missing. Suddenly, yes. there's all these phishing scams which are preying on the curiosity and the vulnerability of people. And we're seeing this with COVID as well, with phishing scams, which is literally sort of, hey, uh, wouldn't you really like to know who in your office has COVID? You know, run this executable and you'll find out. And I, I think that sort of stuff is particularly recalcitrant because it is it is profiting and taking advantage of people when they're at their most vulnerable.
Okay, no, no, that's uh, that, that's uh, that's a that's a fair point, and uh, it's interesting. I guess uh, it's those vulnerabilities. When you look at South Africa, for example, we've had two large data leaks that have happened in just mm. uh, the last year or so. I'm sure you've heard about them. Oh, yeah. Um, um. I mean, if, if my details get exposed, for example, and the, my data is out there, what's the best way of protecting myself from becoming a victim to these uh, attackers or these thieves who've sol stolen the data? How do I protect myself in 2020? It, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, and, uh, and I didn't actually answer part of the question that you raised before, which was around uh, uh, breaches in different parts of the world and what they look like. And... Yeah, you, you have an interest in, in South Africa. A lot of the time I speak to journalists here, they have a, an interest in Australia. Listen, you, you're all on the internet. <laughs> you know, like everyone is subject yeah, yeah. to the same risks. Their uh, data breaches and security incidents are the great leveler. Uh, they, they don't discriminate in any way. It's like, are you on the internet? Yep, fine, you're a target. So, yeah, the, the answer for, for South Africa is the same for here and it's the same for everywhere else in the world, which is that we've got to expect that information that, that we hand over, not necessarily always in digitised format. I was in the Australian Red Cross Blood Service data breach. I never digitised data. I literally filled out a form when I donated blood mm, in mm. pencil on a piece of paper and ended up online. So all of this stuff gets digitised and we've got to work on the assumption that it may at one time be exposed. So how do we... How do we minimize at risk? Uh, one of the really practical ways is to practice data minimization. So l let us only provide what information we need to in order to perform the task we're there for. If you sign up on a website and it asks you for your date of birth, do you need to give it your date of birth? If you're signing up on a website to comment on cats, you probably don't need to. If you're signing up to a government program in order to, let's say, get a... Uh, we, we have a program called JobKeeper here to try and subsidise people during the COVID period. Well, you're probably going to need to do that. You can't escape it. But to be yeah. a bit selective about that, uh, I'm I'm busily writing about uh, IoT and IoT security things at the moment. And what, one of the points I'm making there is that when we talk about devices that are connected to the internet in the house, have a think about what you want to digitise. Uh, do you want to point a camera in your child's bedroom and have it recording information because once you digitize something it can be lost so the the overarching theme here is that we have control to some extent about how much information we provide and how much we digitize and if we can minimize that we minimize our risk I mean, so uh, you really have to think twice <clears throat> about everything that you do and what kind of digital footprint you want to leave behind and what's important and what's not important, I guess. I mean, you're a pretty high-profile security researcher. Has Troy Hunt ever been hacked? Oh, well, I, I, I think <laughs> we, we need to sort of define that term hacked because it, it is used very liberally. So I am in over 20 data breaches in Have I Been Pwned. So there are over 20 incidents that I know of <laughs> where I have been pwned. Now, uh, that's my information that has appeared on a website somewhere. Does that mean that I have been hacked? I think that's a very sort of strong term. Uh, I, I would be happier if we used that term less and we talked more about what actually happened. So, for example, I see people the whole time say, my Netflix was hacked. It's like... Okay, was Netflix hacked or did you did you have a terrible password that you used everywhere and someone just literally logged into your account and Netflix did exactly what it's meant to do? <laughs> you know, it's probably like the yeah. latter. But I, I think the uh, to, to go back to have have I been in security incidents? Well, well, yes, because the problem is per that Red Cross blood uh, Red Cross blood service example, a lot of this is beyond your own control. That there is nothing that I can do to stop myself from appearing in a data breach from a service I've signed up to. The only thing I can do is minimize my risk by data minimization, which I mentioned before, uh, using a password manager, making sure that all my passwords are strong and unique. That's one of the biggest problems at the moment. People get passwords from one breach service and then they just go and log on to all your other things because most people use the same one everywhere. Yeah, and I think a password a password manager is probably the best way to go. I think you're spot on there. I mean, in South Africa, for example, there's a big drive now, and and the law has been, you know, it's been made into law, and you know, companies have got a few more months to comply. And I'm talking about the Protection of Personal Information Act, and I know in Australia you've got something very similar, and the government's really strict on that sort of thing. Uh, do you think the governments are doing enough uh, with regards to the protection of personal information and how companies are handling the data that we trust them to handle 
It's it's kind of funny because it's almost like saying, you know how we're going to stop these data breaches? We're going to make it illegal for them to happen. <laughs> it's like, okay, that will stop everyone, won't it? Look, um, yeah, probably the, the, the greatest privacy law that, that's had positive impact and probably the most well-known would be GDPR in Europe. Uh, yes. We have a notifiable data breach scheme here in Australia and we've got various other privacy laws which are significantly weaker than in Europe, and of course, the US, California is getting things like CCPA, which, which again, aim to do the same thing in terms of providing protections to personal data. And, and look, they, they do have positive impact in that organisations are now more incentivised than what they were before to protect the data. But clearly, it also doesn't solve the problem. And, and part of the underlying issue here is that our data is extremely valuable to the companies that we provide it to. Uh, you know, think about the social media platforms we use. That's enormously valuable. So all these companies are trying to figure out how do we get as much personal data as we can, not fall too far afoul of the law, push the boundaries to the point where we can keep as much of it as we can because it's really valuable stuff. And, you know, we'll sort of see how it all works out. Mm -hmm. But I mean, um, uh, but 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 companies. Do you think that companies should be held responsible? I mean, they should. I mean, they should have a level of security in protecting our data, for example. Uh, but when you look at some of the fines and uh, you know mm -hmm. the, the legal ramifications, that they they they're pretty stringent, uh, especially in South Africa. If if the law gets broken, um, you know, hefty fines and even the CEO of an organisation can even go to jail if it's if it's a pretty bad breach. So I, I think the, the easy answer to should companies be held accountable, well, well yes, if, if I give my data, let, let's just say it's Adobe, simply because it was yeah. one of the first breaches I put into Hello Empire. Uh, I gave my data to Adobe. Actually, I didn't even give it to Adobe. I gave it to Macromedia, and then Adobe bought Macromedia. But let's say it's Adobe or a subsidiary. If I give them the data and they lose it, they are accountable. Now, there's then a question of did they take reasonable and necessary steps in order to protect the data? And, and to be fair here, we can all look at an organisation today and say, are they doing the right thing with our data? And you, you could go through, you could audit them and go, yep, okay, it looks pretty good. doesn't mean they're not going to have a data breach. It just means that they have met the expectation we have of protecting right. data. Now, I am sympathetic to organisations that have a data breach despite best intentions to avoid it and despite doing things that by any reasonable measure were sufficient. None of this stuff is foolproof. What I'm particularly uh, less patient about is organisations having breaches due to egregious oversights or lax security. And, and, mm. and just to sort of pick something like really, really easy to, to focus on, the way passwords are stored. Any organisation right now can look at the way they're collecting customer data and storing passwords and they can tell very, very objectively, is it terrible? So no password cryptographic storage whatsoever, no hashing or nothing. Uh, is it really, really antiquated? Are they using an MD5 hash and it's going to be cracked in seconds anyway? Or are they doing something really, really good? Now, if they're doing yeah. something on the bad end of the spectrum, we can look at that right now and go, this is useless if you get breached. This is going to cause a lot of pain to the customers who are in that database. Now, in cases like that, Yes, like I want to see the book thrown at them because they should have done better. In cases where they've really done the right thing with the storage uh, and the data breach was highly sophisticated and took advantage of things which we couldn't reasonably expect the organisation to prevent against, I'm kind of okay with that. And I think the, the overarching theme here is that there is a spectrum and that the question is where should the organisation be on the spectrum? Okay, so how, to, how does Troy Hunt protect himself? Are you constantly running through a VPN? Uh, what kind of um, antivirus are you using on your machines, for example? Is your phone vulnerable? What kind of phone are you using? How do you stay protected, Troy Hunt? Ah, nice try. That's a secret. No, actually, I can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so look, a, a lot of it is is really just the fundamental stuff. And, and when we look at the advice that's given to people about protecting themselves, usually when something goes wrong, it's because they haven't followed basic steps. So a really obvious one is I have a password manager. Uh, I use one password, the password manager I have done for the last decade. Every single account I have has a strong, unique password. It's randomly generated. Every single account where two-factor authentication is available, it is turned on. 
all of my machines, whether they be my PC or my iPhone or, geez, even my watch, they all auto-update and take any security patches or other patches as soon as they are available. I use a VPN for some things where privacy is more important than it was before. Uh, I use a Windows Defender in terms of antivirus. So there's a, a lot of evidence out there to suggest that going and spending money on other commercial products doesn't necessarily do a lot for you. I practice data minimization. I'm very careful about the emails and the attachments I open. There's a whole bunch of sort of practical things on top of this as well. Um, I've got a, a, a very, let's just say, a, a very robustly configured network <laughs> as well. No, it's, it sounds like it. It sounds like but you're also applying logical sense. Um, um, I mean, the things that you mentioned, they, they really aren't difficult things to implement. Those are the baselines that we should all be doing in this digital world that we're living in. We should all be focusing on the kinds of things that you spoke about, and they really aren't difficult to execute. They really are uh, big wins and easy wins. Um, so, so, so thanks for that advice, Troy. Great, great, great a bit of advice. And in, in your opinion, um, the most overlooked risks right now that we face globally, I know that there's been a massive push to, to the cloud and people are working mm -hmm. remotely. Um, I would imagine there are security risks over there. Um, or for example, are you, well, I'll ask you that question as my final one, but what are your final, what are your overlooked security? What are the overlooked overlooked security risks that we have every day that you think are out Look, there? If, if we were to sort of take an evidence-based approach on this, the most overlooked security risk is credential stuffing, which is exploiting credential reuse. So we're seeing yeah. these credential stuffing attacks where attackers are getting lists of credentials, sometimes credential pairs numbering in the billions, like, you know, billion plus email address, password pairs. And some percentage of those, I mean, let's say for argument's sake, only 10% of these people have reused their passwords everywhere. That's still what, like 100 million usable credential pairs. Now, the, yes. I, I think it's a really interesting security situation because it is sort of a joint responsibility. We've got to try and get people to stop doing that because that's bad practice. Also, the organisations who then have hundreds of millions of credential pairs thrown at them in order to see if someone can log on with them, we've got to do a better job there of protecting from that sort of stuff from happening in the first place. So it's it's one of these sort of joint responsibility things. But to me, that's the biggest risk because it is such a rampant thing. And every other week, we see a big news headline about a massive brand name falling victim to credential stuffing. Mm. No, absolutely. Um, Trey, where do you see this all going? Three to five years, I know, difficult to predict into the future, <laughs> but they say that the next the next war is going to be a cyber war. It's not going to be a physical war. And we're already seeing that, you know, the Chinese and the Americans and the Russians trying to hack into each other's systems. I mean, is that where it is? Is that where the game has been played between countries trying to get into each other's systems and steal valuable data? Where do you see oh. it in three to five years? I'll give you one thing for sure. I'll make you a gentleman's bet. In three to five years from now, we'll have more passwords than we've ever had before. We're not getting rid of passwords. <laughs> so that's still <laughs> going to be there. And then in terms of nation states and the whole cyber warfare, that look, the, the reality of it is, is that there's a huge amount of value in digital assets. Uh, digital assets can be uh, accessed or obtained or compromised in ways that are not only far easier, but also far harder to trace than, say, kinetic warfare. Uh, as we have wars in the future, will they be all digital? Or almost certainly they won't be all digital. They will be a combination of kinetic and digital. This is just going to be the nature of how things work. But I think that what we're seeing is just a huge amount of value shifting to that digital side as we have more and more things connected and more value in those connected things. So inevitably, it's an augmentation of the two, but it's definitely shifting to a much greater emphasis on the digital. Troy, it's such a pleasure talking to you thank you so much for your time mate and uh i didn't want to raise the sport issues between south africa and australia but that's for another conversation altogether but you guys have got a great rugby team this season and uh it's fantastic chatting to you and uh, wish you well um over the ne the rest of this pandemic whenever it ends um i'm sure that you missed the traveling and you haven't been traveling as much as 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 uh, what most people do but uh you take care of yourself and thank you for your time troy thank you very much see you later